responsibility with Bay Area Black Leaders in recognition of Juneteenth 2020. My name is Angela Johnson, and I'm the founder and co-CEO of Coalition of Black Excellence, which is an all-volunteer-run 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to unify and elevate the Black community. So tomorrow will be a Juneteenth like no other. In addition to the restrictions on gatherings still in place across the country due to the coronavirus um, and the disproportionate impact of the coronavirus on our community, this year's Juneteenth also comes as we watch members of our community and allies come together in protest, outraged by the brutal killings of George Floyd, Amon Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and so many Black lives lost to police brutality and systemic racism. We've seen an overwhelming change in discourse from our community organizations to our governments, to our corporations. And I think the question that is on a lot of our minds is, will this last? Are we witnessing the start of a sustainable long-term movement for racial equity and justice, or is this just another Band-Aid? Um, so I'm so excited to have this group of panelists today who's coming from a variety of perspectives to help us think through some of these tough questions. Our goal for tonight is that we leave this conversation mindful of our different perspectives, aware of how our actions can, can have an impact, and inspired to continue our actions in pursuit of justice and quests for true change individually and together. So before introducing this amazing panel, a few rules of the road. Um, this session will be recorded and will be posted on CBE's YouTube page and distributed uh, um, after this session. Uh, again, please turn off your video so that our speakers will be the only faces recorded for the session. If you have questions throughout, you can chat them to the host and we'll uh, read them. Or you can wait until the end the la at 7 o'clock. We'll open it up. Um, if you turn on your camera, then we'll know you have a question and you will be unmuted. So right now you won't be able to unmute yourself. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Liku Madushi, who is a Bay Area native, a first generation Tanzanian. She currently practices employment litigation and has an interest in researching issues pertaining to um, the impacts of institutionalized injustice against black people. Her most recent publication, Mind on Lock, the impact of incarceration on black mental health was published with the Harvard Journal of African American Policy. And prior to that, Liku published Policing the Police, Racial Implicit Bias and the Necessity of Limiting Police Discretion to Use Militarized Gear Against Protesters in the Southern University Law Review. She founded Tribe LLC, whose purpose is to bring together Black women across different spectrums to help serve as a resource to one another. And of course, my favorite feature is that she is a volunteer as program director for CBE. So Liku, over to you and our esteemed panelists. Thank you, Angela. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Like Angela said, we have a diverse set of panelists, um, Tyra Fennell, Will Hayes, Derek Brown, and Charles Bell. And I'm going to let them take it away with introducing themselves to you and letting them know what they're passionate about. Go ahead, Tyra. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Tyra Fennell. Um, I'm a native Washingtonian, but right now I live in, I've lived in San Francisco a little over 10 years. Um, I am the founder of Imprint City, an arts organization that finds underutilized spaces in San Francisco and activates them with art to support the local economy, the neighborhood merchants. Um, right now we're hyper-focused in the Bayview Hunters Point. Um, I'm also uh, on the Film Commission in San Francisco and serve on the Mayor's um, COVID-19 Economic Recovery Task Force as well as a Howard University graduate. I have to say that because that's just what you do, so. <laughs> Go ahead, Will. Yeah, I'm Will Hayes. I'm the uh, CEO of uh, LucidWorks. We're a technology company here in San Francisco. We provide a search engine for large retail brands to uh, serve up personalized search results, recommendations using a combination of big data and AI to uh, help craft those experiences. Um, I'm a Bay Area native. I grew up in the East Bay uh, in the El Sobrante, Richmond area. I've been living in San Francisco for about 20 years. Um, outside of my work in just uh, building technology, I'm very focused on how we build more inclusion of the Bay Area ecosystem um, into technology, particularly as we try to bring more people of color, 
African American, Latino into uh, the tech industry. Um, I commend the efforts to reach out to historically black colleges and, and, and places across the country. I think we can do a much better job investing right here in our backyard. We have a very culturally rich uh, community, we have a very diverse community, but this community has very little representation in the opportunity and the wealth creation that uh, technology, the technology industry in the Silicon Valley in particular are providing. And so hoping to kind of bring some awareness and, and, and drive that bridge between the, uh, the communities being impacted by technology and the community in which technology operates. Charles. Hi, my name is this on there. Uh, hi, my name is Charles Bell. Uh, I am the executive director and founder of a public policy institute. Uh, startup policy lab located here in San Francisco. Uh, we look at the intersection of government technology to make government more open, transparent, and accessible. My work has been on public data and privacy uh, rights, especially with protecting uh, some of the most vulnerable communities. Since 2014, I have served on the Committee on Information Technology here in San Francisco, which sets IT policy for the city of San Francisco. Um, uh, and I've worked on actually democracy issues, uh, so securing and advancing democracy since 2016 in a variety of different ways. So that's election systems um, protection, election systems building protection um, and public comment processes. I'm a native of North Beach here in San Francisco. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of Bay Area love here. Thank you for having me. Derek. Hey, hey good evening, everyone. Uh, C CBE, thank you so much for having me. Um, all of my panelists, this is incredible. Just be on this panel with you all. Uh, my name is Derek Brown, uh, Senior Advisor at SFPD. Uh, native of San Francisco, born and raised in a Western tradition. Uh, community is my heart. Community is the love of my life. Uh, I've been involved um, building relationships throughout the community um, and, and doing amazing work throughout uh, for a little over 20 years now. Um, I know Tyra shot out her college, but I got a shout out uh, all, all my bears in the house. So, uh, you know, go bears. You know, you got to represent where we can. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, like I say, love the work that I do, uh, love bridging the gap, um, and doing this for several years now, and have been have the pleasure to work with a lot of people on this panel as well. And thanks again for having me. Really appreciate it. Okay, I see we got started with a little bit of college banging, a little college slide, you know, let's keep that same energy. So we're going to into... I told you go to Derek. What's the... <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. So that's, what I, that's, that's my thought. We're going to do this. <laughs> okay, Will, so I'm going to start with you. Um, as a Black CEO, how have you handled our current events surrounding uh, police brutality with your company? And what do you think makes other people look at companies and conclude that they're being performative? when they put out public statements or press releases? Yeah, it's, 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 it's tough. And I'll be the first to admit that um, it was a struggle for me to really kind of come to grips with with both my, my personal feelings and emotions and, and then just what was being asked of me. Um, I remember, you know, my first reaction when, particularly after the Floyd murder and, and, the, and the events that followed, um, you know, was one of what most of us were feeling of just disgust and, and despair. And then, you know, just this sort of feeling of hopelessness. And, and, you know, one of the ways that we tend to cope with that is we just, we focus on our families, we focus on our communities, we focus on kind of what's right there in front of us. And this is just a condition that, you know, I've developed over the years, a number of us have developed over the years. Um, what was different this time around was suddenly there was this, this sort of this call to, to make statements. And a lot of people were reaching out to me internally from various departments saying, we need, we need to put out a statement. And I was thinking to myself, like, you know, was it all of a sudden, is, is police brutality a concern for me? All of a sudden, is racial discrimination a concern for me? I could have put a statement out last week, last month, and I can tell you right now that the, the reaction to that would be negative. And so it took a little soul searching on my own to say, okay, how do I want to approach this? And in the end, um, I had some, you know, great support and advice and just said, just tell the truth. And I did. And I wrote a letter to my team and I told them, look, you know, this is, these are my experiences. I'm going to tell you stories of, of experiences that I've had that have kind of shaped my worldview, particularly around law enforcement and the relationship between law enforcement and, 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 and black folks in particular. And, uh, and I believe that it, it definitely sent a powerful message. Um, when you look out into the ether now, and, um, you know, I appreciate a lot of what is being said. I appreciate the attention being brought to, to issues. I appreciate statements around Juneteenth. I think all of these 
these things are, are right, the right step forward. The question is going to be what happens six weeks from now, six months from now, six years from now. Do we continue with that consistency and that focus? Um, the last thing I'll say is that I feel there is an elevated sense of listening that's happening today. And so if I'm going to feel you know, optimistic about anything, it's, it's just that, that dimension of the conversation is different than it's been for really the last 10 years when we first kind of heard the term Black Lives Matter. Um, the reaction was not curiosity. It was not listening. In fact, people were trying to tell their own story on top of the lived stories of individuals. And that was, that was a real problem. And it's kind of disenfranchised a number of us. But this time I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic and I'm partnering with leaders that want to try to you know, do things right. Um, but I think we all have to be cautious about our expectations going forward. I absolutely agree. And like you said, there's a heightened level of listening. There's a heightened level of watching, um, especially now that we're all quarantined, we're at home, mm -hmm. we're only in front of the screen, in front of the news. Um, sharing information and opinions. And so I want to turn it to you, Tyra, from a, a community standpoint, as we're watching and listening to these companies and seeing how they move and then put out their bold statements. How can we as a community hold them accountable so that it's not just a statement, so that the next several years when these things continue to occur, they've um, put something in place or taken some type of action that's you know, contributing towards everyone moving forward from that. I mean, I'm not a big believer in begging companies that are clearly built for white people to have an epiphany and all of a sudden go from 1% hiring to, I don't know, 25% hiring, or at least the national average is like 13% higher, hires um, that are black. Um, I just don't necessarily feel those companies are built for that. And they're really good at presenting optics through their diversity inclusion hires. But ultimately, after years of like banging on the tech doors and protesting and all that, they're still at a very small percentage of black hires. I'm really big on black empowerment. Um, I don't think anyone is coming to save us. I think we have to really look inward and save ourselves as much as humanly possible at our 12% national rate. Um, that means um, empowering small businesses in the black community. That means ensuring that um, you not only look to national politics, but you really get involved hyper-locally because that really hits the ground much quicker. So are you involved in your community, your local democratic clubs? Are you involved in your local organizations that are dealing with some of these pertinent issues like universal legal access is a big one, right? Um, I think us as individual black people, we need to also support black communities. Even if we don't live in concentrated black communities, they are there in the Bay Area. It's no reason we can't use our talent, our money, and our time to go and invest in those communities, mentoring, donating to organizations doing work in those communities, just being visible. So I'm really big on um, Black economic empowerment, self-empowerment, how am I supporting the Black community? And you know, the, the national scale is a little cerebral because we don't feel it and touch it as quickly. Um, so I really encourage people to look to the local politics and what they're doing in black communities themselves. Who are they hiring if they're, if they're capable of hiring people? Things like that. No, I completely agree that um, we as black people shouldn't go, like you said, begging or you know, requesting anyone make these changes for our benefit. And I agree that empowerment of our own communities is a way to go, is a way to build ourselves up, make sure that we, are, we have our own resources and we're essentially able to take care of each other. So my next question to you, um, we could probably talk about this all night, but my next question to you is, you know, as people who are already living in this system or have to go to work in these spaces um, or, um, you know, have to be involved with people who don't look like us, whether mm -hmm. it's just a job, whether it's for survival, um, whether that's just what they want to do, what are some different ways that while we're in those circumstances, we can still empower each other? Yeah, I mean, I look at different, different, our community is not a monolith as that's been the narrative through this election cycle. So everyone has a part to play, you know? I have a particular talent, I feel, in being able to walk many different places as myself, not code switching, and being able to just to um, maneuver those different areas, whether it's internationally, whether it's a city hall, whether it's in the hood. I just know how to do that. And I've always been like that. So why not use that talent 
to be the great translator and to be the base, the great redistribution of resources. If I go to City Hall or I secure grants from the Rainin Foundation, I'm definitely rolling that to the community in some way, shape or form because I have that ability. Some people in the community, you need them sometimes to come out and make noise at meetings and sort of have their voices heard. They have a role to play too. So it's just a matter as an organizer to look at the black community holistically and see where, does, where can everyone fit in? And furthermore, making sure you educate those that don't understand how these processes work and where they fit in the chain. Because a lot of times people in the, in the I live in Bayview Hunters Point, and a lot of times people in the Bayview, they know what's going on. They just don't understand where to channel that energy. They don't understand how all the pieces fit together. So I'm really big on educating um, my community members through my Democratic Club on that process and involving them in the whole advocating piece. You know, I love that you highlight um, that we all do have different roles to play. Like this panel is diverse. We're all playing different roles mm -hmm. in this society and trying to uplift the black community. So that's definitely true. Um, speaking of community, I actually want to turn to you, Derek. See you nodding your head. You knew it was coming. So, <laughs> um, like Angela said, I, uh, I published an article before I graduated school regarding police interactions with black protesters and how the militarized response um, is often based on implicit bias. Um, this was around um, the times of Ferguson and when all those protests were going on. And, you know, it's obvious that people are walking down the street chanting, they're peacefully protesting initially, but when they're met with, you know, armor from head to toe, the batons and the shears and all of that, it communicates to the community, and this is my argument, that, you know, we want to fight. Like, it's an us against them thing. Like, the police aren't there to protect the community and serve their community like they're supposed to do or people think they're supposed to do. So with that police community relationship, we've always pointed out like the police need to do this we need reform for this the police should not do that etc cetera, etc cetera. but since this is a relationship you know i've never really heard anyone ask the question what can we do on the community front to ensure that you know the future of police community relations you know benefit everyone yeah and that's a, a, a phenomenal looking question so thank mm -hmm. you for asking that um, one of the things that I've been inspired by, uh, especially this past couple of weeks, is the community. Uh, for instance, myself, you know, as a black male, you know, growing up in the city, growing up in the Mo, um, and, and sitting in the seat that I'm sitting in now, uh, I'm a community guy. But I'm on the police side, so my job is to kind of bridge that gap. So one of the things that I noticed uh, this past few weeks, my phone's been blowing up with, uh, community leaders reaching out um, that haven't necessarily, you know, put together a rally or put together a march. But they're reaching out like, like, D, I want to do something. I want to put together a rally. I want to do this. So what I've been doing daily is helping them organize, helping them mobilize, uh, making sure that uh, police is in the loop for just pertaining to just keeping the streets kind of peaceful or just blocking it off if we're doing marches and, you know, securing City Hall. And I've been out there, you know, marching nonstop. I've been kneeling and then bringing officers out there as well, just to make sure that, you know, we can start doing things together. But, but not only that, um, you know, I've been in this role now for about two years, but as soon as I came on board, one of the first things that I noticed um, that I wanted to make sure we can kind of bridge that gap with the African-American community and SFPD. So, what I did was created the first annual SFPD Black History Month celebration. So, uh, you know, I got community leaders, African American community leaders together with officers to plan something special so we can celebrate, you know, the Black individuals, the Black families, the Black kids, and just celebrate Blackness throughout the city, but do it in conjunction with SFPD. So, we did a, an incredible event at the Fillmore Heritage Center last year and then this past year we did a second annual event uh you know mayor breed chief scott and others came out to celebrate and there we were just an experience where we're just hanging out we're just having a good time we're figuring out ways that we can work together we're having a dialogue we're having that conversation um and then 
we followed up with uh, something that I created, which was the Chief's Community Advisory Forums, where we identify community leaders throughout the city, whether you know, it's African Americans, Latino, Chinese American, you name it. And my approach was to be proactive. So uh, have the chief and command staff meet with members of the community, whether it was monthly or quarterly, to build that relationship and then listen to the community and figure out ways that we can support the police reform, uh, which we've been kind of enacting that throughout the past a uh, couple years, but um, but like I said, this past couple weeks, I've been uh, super excited to see the youth involved, and you know, excited to march with them and stand in solidarity. But um, it's something that we have to continue to do because I feel you know our officer and community need to work together as one. And for myself, it, it's interesting because uh, you know, just even growing up, you know, I never really you know care for the police or anything like that growing up in the mo, but um, now, you know, I'm starting to meet officers and, you know, start to humanize officers and really get community to understand and know them. But we're a long ways away from where we need to be, but it's something that we need to continue to grow and continue to strengthen. And I definitely think programs like yours is what's going to get us there because I love that you're involving the community in these activities or these initiatives that you make up. Like, I don't I don't believe that, you know, you would advise some officers to show up in, in riot gear or something. Oh, no, 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 even, no. Even if they did, um, or if someone was to direct or advise them as such, it probably wouldn't feel like it was the right thing to do. No. Because, you know, when you're involved with the community, you start no. to build that bond, like, you know, Absolutely. I'm not going to do my people like that. And, and case in point uh, that you said that, so when I first came on board, one of the things like I expressed, the officers need to connect with the community. So what I did in a lot of events with Tyra as well in the community, one of the things I said to the officers, I just need you to be out there, you know, build on relationships, just have conversations, hang out. And they look at me like, D, what do you mean? Just, just go and hang out. No, just go and hang out, have a conversation. You know, don't worry about, you know, having a stand guard and all that stuff. So it, it's been a process, but one, one that they weren't used to, but now they know when I'm teeing up different opportunities throughout the city, they already know when I'm getting officers to come out is just to continue to build that relationship, have a conversation, have a dialogue, um, and just really show them that, you know, we're human. So well, thank you. I love that. Thank you for doing that for us. Mm -hmm. Charles, hey. So um, what I want to ask you is, you know, with these different perspectives and the energy that we currently have from all of these uh, protests and the responses and just the collective action that people want to take in conjunction with uh, people and organizations who've been doing this work for years uh, before all of this occurred, like CBE, like the NAACP, how can we take all of that and, you know, transform it into effective policy? So how do the, the kind of the politics meet the policy for long-term change? Um, I'm going to touch a little bit upon uh, on something that uh, Will mentioned in terms of this moment. Uh, sure. Can you hear me okay? Sorry. Yes. Um, when, uh, you know, he said, I could have commented on this, you know, a few weeks ago or a month ago or a year ago, <laughs> but I would have gotten kind of in trouble for that. But now everyone seems to be paying attention to it. And, and what I, speaking very broadly, and I'll drill it down, I think what the protests reflect is a, uh, a loss of feeling of accountability, actually by a wider range of people than before. Uh, and that, that there are a variety of factors I think fit, fit into that, but that's a longer conversation. So I'm just gonna keep it there. Uh, but that loss of a feeling of accountability is with the police, it's with uh, the legal system, uh, and it's with elected officials on multiple, multiple levels, right? So to win, to harness that energy that we have from the protests into long-term change, it means you have to start thinking long-term and like think about what does that really mean long-term? So the, the protests are really focused on the use of force. And when we talk about police reform, for example, there's use of force, there's bias, transparency and accountability, uh, uh, community uh, policing, excuse me, and even discussions around qualified uh, immunity doctrine at the federal level, right? There's a lot of issues when we talk about police reform and what that can look like. So right now we're very much focused on use of force, but I think of that as a policy, kind of policy walk, as the tip of the spear. 
Uh, and I think of the policy laws as the rest of that, the rest of that sphere. And that's the rest of the sphere that uh, our community needs to take a hold of or break, depending on, how, depending on your perspective on that. And there, just to quickly expound on that, just so people understand what I'm saying, uh, it's not to diminish use of force. It's not to diminish the fact that black men and black women are being killed with impunity. It's simply to point out that that's actually the enforcement mechanism of a series of laws and infrastructure that's been built in this country for hundreds of years. Plessy v. Ferguson gave states the right to, you know, separate but equal uh, in terms of uh, how they, you know, how they're treating, um, you know, different communities. Um, redlining and covenants uh, prevented, you know, the black community from purchasing property in certain areas, and that was developed by private actors that, that was, in, you know, supported by uh, the government actors. And um, oh, my favorite one, actually, Derek, you might appreciate this too. Like, you know, Colin Kaepernick still doesn't have a job, <laughs> right? You know, he's more talented, has a, is more accomplished than most people. He still doesn't have a job. That's actually almost like an antitrust issue in terms of the collusion that the NFL has. So when I talk about the tip of the spear, it's not to diminish it. It's incredibly important, but it means that we have to break down all of these other pieces, and that's where policies and laws kind of come into place. So uh, how do we get there? Uh, the first thing, and this is uh, to touch on, um, um, uh, excuse me, Tyra's point, because I agree with her, and she's, she's been great. I've seen you actually in the, in the San Francisco political scene. Getting involved Thanks. at the local level, yeah, yeah, getting involved in the local level, um, and uh, this was just recently started the run uh, at the local level, uh, really does have impact. Uh, people are looking, you know, we're accustomed to kind of looking to the federal government, I think, especially within the black community. We're accustomed to looking to the federal government to protect, to protect our rights, not to protect us, not for a handout, but actually to protect our rights, right? Um, our civil rights, and whether it's, you know, in cities in the South or, or just, you know, purchasing property around the country. Uh, so that's where the policies are going to start for our changes. We have to elect the right people uh, into office. And I'll give you a quick example uh, of what I, uh, what I mean by that. Uh, my mother right now is very sad about everything that's going on. And one of the things that she laments is that she's like, you know, we marched and we marched and we marched and nothing changed. Uh, and my father was the head of the NAACP chapter here in San Francisco and was involved in the desegregation school fights here uh, uh, in San Francisco. So they were very involved. But the one thing I could say to her was, you fought when you fought, when you guys were marching and you're launching those lawsuits, the mayor was one of the obstacles. Uh, and this isn't a, a plug necessarily for, for Mayor Breed. Really, I want to talk about, you know, there's Mayor Breed in San Francisco, the mayor of Atlanta, the mayor of DC, the mayor of Chicago, all black women, right? It's very different having them in charge. Uh, because when they are in charge, we can start talking about <laughs> law and policy very differently. Uh, because that's where the, the, the kind of rubber meets the road. About They're the ones that can start to either drive or if it's just strict policy within agencies, possibly even directly implement. And the example that I will give uh, is San Jose's mayor. Uh, he was happy to take a knee with the protesters and say he stood with them. But as soon as calls came to defund the police, he held up his hands and said, no way. Now, I'm not criticizing him directly. I don't live in San Jose. I live in San Francisco. But uh, it shows you the impact on, um, on just the political impact when we want to change policies. So uh, that's kind of a long-winded point to say is how do we actually change the policies? We have to have people in charge uh, because there's a difference between law and policy. Uh, with law, we, uh, we pass a law, we pass a, a ballot measure, for example, or the Board of Supervisors well, votes on it. Policies, on the other hand, often are, are about rules that operate how the agencies operate. And so that means whom you hire, right? If you have a Derek in charge, Derek, you know, can influence or, you know, influence, shape, or direct the policies within the organization uh, that will govern how they operate on a day-to-day -day basis. In San Francisco, we see this with the, uh, I won't go too deep on this, but on the, the um, police recommendations uh, from the DOJ, whether they've been implemented or not. They haven't been, <laughs> to the most part, less than 50% been implemented. But that's, but that's driven by the leadership that we have in charge of SFPD. That's driven by the police commission, that's driven by uh, Chief Scott, that's driven you know, some extent by the board and the mayor involved. So when we talk about long-term change, um, I'm talking very high level on purpose, we're talking about putting elected leaders in uh, that can actually break down that sphere, that can actually go into the policies that are driving a lot of the operations of these agencies, whether it's a police department or a commission um, that's, that's setting the rules and practices for how the police operate. So I'll, I'll stop there, but um, I, I, would, I just want to plus one up again on what Tyra said, and that is please join uh, local commissions, please join your local party organizations, because a lot of that starts at that local level and then drives up from there. Thank you. Um, you know, having leaders that look like us do make a huge difference. And I can hear examples of the black female mayors that we have. Um, 
they have a, a different type of attention. They take a different, different type of action. So I'm sure we could all appreciate that. Again, going back to, you know, working in um, these systems where a lot of people don't look like us. Um, on, I believe it was Monday the other day, we all agreed that, you know, allies are necessary in this, you know, uh, this goal that we have to attain change in multiple avenues. But what does allyship, what does genuine allyship, and I say genuine because you mentioned the San Jose mayor who took a knee and then was kind of like, oh wait, never mind, you know, when it came to taking some action. So what does genuine allyship um, look like for each of you in your spectrums? Well, first of all, I just want to say this. If we look at the juxtaposition between how the LGBTQ movement has been moving in a positive direction, really um, from the beginning of the Obama administration to now and the, the strides they've made, we also have to look, of, look at the human capital that helps get that going. I mean, the LGBTQ community is very organized. They're very cohesive around advocating for themselves. They show up, they donate, they're involved in the whole process. And I think when I said earlier about making sure the black community, really specifically the low income black community that a lot of these local policies impact and frankly federal policies impact the most, making sure they understand their role in the whole process. So if we have a police chief like Chief Scott, African-American police chief, he has a vantage point where he wants to do reform change as well, but he needs cover. These people need political cover. Mayor Breed needs cover, the mayor of San Jose. They have funders, they have people that have donated to their campaigns, they have you know, police unions that can do all sorts of crazy stuff if you don't you know, do what they want. And so you need the community to step up and show up for these leaders if they're gonna run the play. So that's what I mean, like everyone has a part to play. London has a whole ecosystem of people that, are, that, she, that she is accountable for, um, accountable to. So when the black community sees an issue that they find really viable and they need our politicians to run the play, we have to show up in different ways. I agree. Yes. Sorry. I agree with that completely. I think one of the, one of the challenges might be for the community right now is what's the vision? Uh, like what's, what are we really trying to get to? And that's moving from that reaction to a, kind of a plan and set of objectives and measurements. And that, that actually and that supports, I think what Tyra was saying in the sense that in the LGBTQ community, they, I think they have a, a clear direction where they want to go. Right. Um, and they're organizing around that. One of the challenges I think we face right now um, as a community, and I'll even pick on San Francisco a little bit in this card, is where are we trying to go? Uh, and, and, I, and from a policy guy, so for me, it's actually fairly, deliverables are actually fairly clear in terms of what I might want or what other people might want. I want to see certain legislation, whether that's uh, getting rid of the qualified immunity doctrine at the federal level. I want to see um, changes in San Francisco policymaking, uh, for example, in terms of uh, mayor's office for, you know, dealing with um, eat and confer, or, you know, what are those tangible things that we lay out? And that goes back to that organizing, having a direction, working together. Uh, and having that plan, whether it's, I'm up in North Beach, I was down uh, in Bayview, but like coordinating and having that together. So I put myself in that as well. It's not a criticism. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll add, I think one of the things, and again, my perspective is probably just, you know, kind of in scope in terms of just the industry that I serve and, and, and kind of where I, where I kind of came up in my, in my career. Um, I'll say that what I don't like and, and what I react very negatively to is this notion that the investments that can be made from venture capital and other facilities of capital into black and brown founders um, is charity is some kind of corporate social response. It drives me crazy because mm -hmm. I've been building companies since I was 12 years old. And I'll tell you, when you meet somebody who comes from a background who's not been to college, who doesn't have a professional network in their family, who had to figure things out on their own despite the uncomfort, despite the lack of network, and they persevere and they succeed, those are traits that make for amazing leadership. They make for amazing entrepreneurs. And so the fact that we're underlooking or we're not looking to this community to build wealth and capital and success, it drives me crazy. And then I see venture capital firms and other companies talk about this and they want to pat on the back and they want to act like this is some kind of charity. We are missing this strategic element. So part of allyship is actually taking a back seat at times and recognizing, look, privilege creates certain opportunities. Lack of privilege means opportunities are limited. How do I use my privilege to open up 
opportunities, but not tell a story for people. How many of these venture capital firms actually spoke to communities of color in technology, in entrepreneurship, and tried to solicit input? No, it's this hero mentality of we're just gonna go figure this whole thing out, I'm sick of it. And so, you know, we could talk about allies and sort of the expectations and how to be a good ally, but step one is listen, just listen. Listen to the stories of others, let them tell their story, and then use your position to create exposure, to create opportunity. And so we have to stop looking at these initiatives in my specific area. Now there's a much broader conversation and I feel way over my, uh, or I feel way just uh, not even qualified to be a part of this panel, but just from my perspective and what's been going on in the Silicon Valley, we are taking the wrong approach and this is not allyship. This is savior mentality. Save it for yourselves. We can mm. save ourselves. What we need is more opportunities for people to come in and leverage what they bring to the table. valuable. And, and speaking of, of leveraging that value, um, and in my standpoint where I am, uh, one of the things I value, our, our value is the allies I have, you know, in various city departments. So, for example, uh, you know, I constantly work with whether it's the Human Rights Commission, uh, Department of Public Health, uh, et cetera, you know, Rec and Park Department, but figuring out ways that we can work together for a common good. Like this case in point, um, a few weeks back, um, we had a meeting with um, faith-based leaders throughout the community. And one of the pastors said, you know, how about, you know, we put together this, you know, community caravan where we can go around the communities like Bayview Hunters Point, Western Edition, Soma, TL, and, and spread the word about COVID-19 and pass out masks and things of that nature. So we were able to take this, um, this idea from the community and then I was able to work closely with our city departments, uh, Human Rights Commission, Mayor's Office, et cetera, and we put together these caravans and week by week, we were able to drive around 15 to 20 cars, city departments, community leaders, faith-based leaders coming together for the common good, but helping out so many communities and neighborhoods throughout the city. So when I look at like allies and I, I look at our city departments and working together for the common good. And kind of along the same lines as um, allyship. Tyra, I believe it was you who um, pointed out in our preliminary call that, you know, we need to be authentic and intentional when it comes to yes. talking about Black people. And right. We often get lumped in this, uh, this group of people of color when uh, it's not just Black people. It, exactly. <laughs> it includes so many other groups. And so when we're talking about, you know, working with allies, how can we, how can we get that message across that, you know, it is just black people that what we do for black people will essentially be a benefit for everyone. And I'll just um, give an example. I think it was when I was in school, we might've been talking about a case, but when, um, you know, people in wheelchairs, when they got the, the cities to change the sidewalks um, or uh, other avenues to which they couldn't roll up on. Essentially, that one change for them benefited everybody with strollers, suitcases, you know, whoever uses wheels and whatnot. Do you think, um, and I'll open this question up to everyone as well, but starting with Tyra, do you think that we can get to that point where we can show allies that, you know, our fight for justice will benefit you all as well? Um, I don't, I don't really function quite like that. I'm big on quid pro quo. Um, I speak with intentionality because I feel like a lot of black people are silenced into saying black because people fear that you want something for black people. There's an underlying fear of what that is. So the people of color is a nice way of sort of couching that. And a lot of black people subconsciously have ascribed to that. But with everything, there's nothing. If you can't identify specifically who you're trying to support or engage um, then it, it often gets diluted. Um, the needs of the Black American community, foundational Black community in America, is not going to be the same as the Latino community in America. However, both groups have needs and we can support each other in reaching our goals, but there has to be a reciprocal um, relationship. No more of the civil rights movement where Black people on the front lines being bloodied and bruised and we get this civil rights act and it, it really benefits everyone, but when we turn around and we need support, where, where is everyone? So I, I'm big on allyship, 
but I'm big on quid pro quo, ensuring that we all have our issues. Let's support each other in getting to our, our, our different goals, but make no mistake, my goal, my community's goal is going to be slightly different from yours. So how can we work together and, and support each other? That's what I'm, I'm big on. I would add to, to, to that because I completely agree and I fall into that trap constantly. It's sort of we've been conditioned in technology to talk about black and brown founders and talk about these, these, these issues as they pertain to people who are you know, underrepresented. So I, I, it just kind of struck me to the heart. Um, I, I do think, again, like the way that we are addressing today feels different just as, as, as I'm talking about as, as, as an industry. And I think that, that the benefit to your point is really about let's provide a framework to understand and to undo systematic oppression or bias or racism. And when you start to focus on a particular problem, and I see this in just in industry, right? Um, your, your messaging is much more clear. Your success rate is much, more right. clear, much easier to follow those examples than if you right. go broad too big. So I, I love that. I do think this is where, and even for me, it was really difficult for me to address the company with the term Black Lives Matter, because again, that conditioning, right? Not to mention- yeah. All paranoia that I have of the backlash and the way I'm going to be perceived. And when I started to kind of step into this conversation, I sort of felt empowered to start using that phrase. And I'm realizing through this conversation, it's because it was a call to action and it was very specific mm -hmm. and people knew exactly what I was talking about. And so I think just using messaging that brings very specific attention is, is incredibly powerful. And the benefit is going to be once we understand the things that we can do to un undo systematic oppression in very narrow scope, right? We're not talking about changing the mm -hmm. world, but if you, cannot, if you can fix a particular problem around hiring, housing, access to medical, legal, um, that provides a framework in which you can follow that for other communities. And so that's the power of getting this right is that we can apply it at scale to a variety of problems as a society. We don't have a framework today. And that's why we're in the same situation we've been in for ever. Yeah. And I just want to add one more thing. When you talk about Black empowerment and intentionality, those other groups also have disenfranchisement amongst their Black demographics. The LGBT community in San Francisco has a terrible reputation with their Black LGBT community and their relationship in San Francisco. So Black Lives Matter to me is not just about isolating black people in a heteronormative sense and not looking at these other groups. It's like, how are black Latinos being treated in other parts of the world and in the US? What's colorism doing to them? How's the LGBT black community in San Francisco dealing with when they have to go to the Castro and be called the N-word? These things are happening through different marginalized communities with one through line, black people are experiencing this. So that's why I'm very big on being intentional around black lives, black empowerment, I'm a black person with ability. And so that's my primary focus. Derek, did you want to add anything? Well, that, that, that was on point. I mean, and just, just spot on. And I mean, and like, you know, I'm African-American, I've been black all my life. And, um, and, and it's, it's one of the things that, um, you know, I try to do is help out, you know, African-Americans as well, all, all, everyone, but in particular mentor as well, uh, big on that, just, you know, working at the Boys and Girls Club of San Francisco for several years, uh, juvenile probation, and then a lot of my work in the city, um, like, like Tyra said, just trying to be intentional about the work that I'm doing, um, continue to try to be proactive with the work we're doing, um, and, and really want to embrace, um, even with Black Lives Matter and embracing that and, you know, standing strong and, and walking in the marches or kneeling and, and kind of just being there for our people. Um, but it, it's also at the same time, uh, looking at allies, um, you know, it was great to see allies out there and working together. But um, similar to Tyra, I'm definitely intentional about the work that I'm doing as well. Absolutely. I, I think we have to be in order to make sure our people are uplifted and taken care of. Derek, I'm going to stick with you uh, and kind of switch gears a little bit. So amongst all of this, amongst the talk of policy reform, there's been um, talk about defunding the police, but there's also been confusion about that. So yeah. can you give a little bit of insight as to what that really means and what it looks like? Yes, yeah. no, absolutely. And thank you for asking that. Um, the, one of the words that I, I don't necessarily say defunding, but I say just redirecting, um, we will be re re redirecting some funds um, from the police department to fund African-American community-based organ organizations, uh, black communities, so specifically to that. So we'll be intentional about the redirecting. 
So um, definitely on board with that. And, and, and looking at a lot of our African-American community, whether it's, you know, we're having the largest population in prison and juvenile and largest population with, you know, dropping out of school and delinquency. Um, so looking at ways now that we can be intentional about our approach, uh, redirect some of the funds from the department to go specifically to the black community I think it's going to be an incredible opportunity, not only for the department and not only for the city, uh, but also for the community. So um, it's something that I'm looking forward to. I know um, August 1st, uh, we get the budget direction. So right now, we don't know what the number would be like, but we know mm -hmm. that uh, we will definitely be redirecting some funds. So just on standby for that. So yeah. I love that. Oops, excuse me. I love that. <laughs> it seems like, you know, that's one of the ways that um, your department's going to be investing in the community. And do you, um, do you have any, um, whether ideas or um, examples about how that redirection of funds within the department can work to benefit police and police conduct? For example, um, I've seen some articles regarding more training or uh, mental health training specifically so that, you know, some of the officers that are going out there act with more compassion mm -hmm. instead of um, just looking to react or, re or arrest. Do you have any thoughts as to yep. that? Absolutely. So first and foremost, definitely training, definitely more and more of that. Um, so that's definitely no brainer. We definitely have to do that. Definitely love that. But right now, as we speak, there's another conversation being taken place right now with um, Human Rights Commission Director Cheryl Davis and Shaman Walton, District 10 Supervisor. Uh, they'll be leading the charge uh, with working with the community to listen to the community, to see what the community wants to do, and particularly the African-American community wants to do with these, with these funds. So um, like I say, training, we definitely have to do more of that. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to listen to the community and see what the community wants. And then we'll have the funding for that so we can start implementing that. So, like I said, I'm literally looking forward to those listening sessions and working with the community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as we're nearing seven, oh, I'm sorry, Charles, did you have something? Can I be a little cynical for just a second? <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, oh, Charles. Bring it on. Bring it on. All right, so defund the police. Now, uh, if we're talking about defunding the police and taking it all the way back to square one and rethinking about what public safety means from the ground up, mm -hmm. and I, I'm okay with that. That's an extreme setting on when I, say def when I say defund the police. I'm talking about eradication and rebuilding with a completely different concept towards what we think about public safety, and that, and that completely changes how we think about the police today. That, that's when I say defund the police. When I talk about policy and that sphere, <laughs> um, Money in this case is defunded, the money is put back in, right? Uh, so it's defunded today, all of a sudden that money gets redirected four years later, right? Um, it goes right back to the police department. We go right back to where we were before, number one. Number two, uh, and I, I write about these things on my blog, uh, on Medium, excuse me, but like we have a massive budget deficit coming up. I don't know how <laughs> to navigate it as well. When I say massive, I mean 1.1 yeah, billion dollars, about 20 to 30% of our discretionary budget. Right, and we're not the only city that's going to have to deal with this. So my point is that money, money is useful and money is great, and we do need to direct funding and resources. I would say to the community, I'm I'm good with that. That's not the criticism. The criticism is saying we're going to direct money right now in the short term because we're going to defund the police when we haven't actually made any of the systemic changes that we need to make to the police. So number one, that goes back to my idea of defunding the police, which would be go back, rebuild the police, the concept of the police department from the ground up, how we think about what, what services they're in charge of, you know, in charge of, what authority they have, how they are partnered with, you know, non-police, you know, uh, in terms of de dealing with particular calls, right? A lot of times we, we have bolted on situations onto the cops that they just should not be in charge of, even they would agree with that. So that's my concern when we say we're going to defund the police and we pat ourselves on the back and say we've done something. It's a temporary uh, respite that makes people feel better, feel like we've achieved something, but that we haven't really broken down the sphere. We haven't gone back in San Francisco. And I'm going to go back on this and I'm not trying to attack you at all there. No, um, but you know, the recommendations 2015, the Obama uh, police re recommendations um, came down for the uh, police reform. San Francisco declined to adopt them. December, 2015, Mario Woods is shot by the SFPD. 2016, the department of justice reforms were, you know, recommendations were picked up by SFPD. 
four years later, less than 50% of those reforms have been approved by a third party auditor. And most of the reforms focus on use of force. They don't focus on transparency and accountability, right? Which is a big issue for me because I'm a public, I'm an open data guy, right? So I always like to see data, I like sunshine. Right now, we have no idea how, you know, police with misconduct records are being passed around the country. Uh, San Francisco hasn't taken a lead on that at all. We defund the police or we reallocate some funding. That might be a short term, uh, even to help, right, to the community. But it's not going to lead to the long term systemic changes that we need to have in the conversation that we need to have. And in that case, again, sorry, Ty, I'm going to back you up on this in terms of how we look at supporting. Uh, and this is because I was running for office too, so I think that's why Tyra and I are kind of the same page here. <laughs> How are we supporting local leaders, um, you know, to give them cover to make substantive changes? And that's my, that's my big concern. I was at the uh, protest, and this will be my last comment on this. When I was at the protest at City Hall where Mayor Breed spoke, but there was a, a young black man, I, don't, I apologize because I don't know his name. He stood up and he basically put all the elected leaders on blast, legit righteous blast. Where he said, in San Francisco, we talk about progressives, we talk about moderates, we talk about tech. Meanwhile, the black community has been suffering this entire time, mm -hmm. right? So that's what I'm trying to get to is what are those changes that A, can support the elected leaders that can come in and have the cover to make B, systemic changes, which go far beyond just moving some cash around. Important, but doesn't actually change the systemic underpinnings that we need to change in order to rethink Mm -hmm. You know, what does it mean to be a police officer? What does it mean to be part of this community? What does it mean to be held to a high standard? What does it mean when someone says I'm SFPD and I am the best like police department in the world because I hit these standards and my community values me and I value my community. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> and, and Charles, your, your, your comments are noted and appreciated. Uh, definitely appreciate that. And, and I know we're pressed for time, but let's definitely circle back offline. A lot of the discussions are going to start taking place. Uh, love to have you at the table to offer your wisdom and your comments. Thank you. No, thank you both gentlemen. Um, we do have six minutes. So if you did want to discuss it a little bit, um, I'm completely open to that. Um, otherwise, I do have a closing question for all of you, but I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Okay. Throw us with the question. <laughs> okay, let's go. As long as it's cool, it gotta be a cool one. It gotta be a fun one. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> it's, it's definitely a good calming question. Okay, okay. To close this out like I mentioned to you Derek we were talking about mental health and for the black community of course that is a huge issue so when we're dealing with all these things like having these conversations is exhausting going to work and having to deal with this is exhausting um, some people are trying to learn and then having to witness all of these things on tape and the constant news cycles is exhausting so we are in a space where, you know, life is just exhausting for so many reasons, the pandemic, job worries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How in these um, different spaces that you're all in, how do we make sure that we take care of each other so we can show up in a quality manner where we can, you know, plan and effectuate these changes when they need to be made? That's another great question. Can I jump in? Somebody want to jump in first? Okay. Got it. Like I'm talking too much. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> you good. I'm good. Go for okay. it. Yeah. No, no. And and, and then that's a, a, a fabulous looking question again. Um, and with like I talked about, you know, in my role, in my world, it's fast paced. It's nonstop. Uh, you know, I'm bridging the gap. Um, I'm working with multiple communities throughout the city as well as city departments. Um, so it's never a dull moment. But for me, uh, one of the things I do to just kind of calm myself and chill is, uh, you know, just hanging out with my daughter. Uh, she plays volleyball and, and she's, she's dominating, doing her thing, but, you know, watching her play or just hanging out with her or, or now that we got the order and the malls are opening up now, you know, going back to the malls with her and, and hanging out and letting her do her thing. But um, I think for me, it, it's kind of, tough finding that balance, but it's something that we all need to do and, and be mindful of that because if we don't, I mean, we'll, we'll definitely go crazy with all the work that we're doing. Um, but I just try to find little things like that or just kind of working out and, or just running and doing my thing. Yeah, I always say that's the, uh, it's the airplane rule, right? You know, you got to put your mask on before you can put your mask on anybody else. And in these times, I think in particular, it's important. It's also important to check in. 
Um, you know, I think a lot of folks are experiencing things differently. Look, we were under a, a, a stay at home order and a pandemic and a lot of economic uncertainty. Um, and then suddenly the, the conversation, which has been there, it's not like, again, that police brutality or racial discrimination is new, but this conversation, at least from my perspective, was just thrusted in, you know, and, and you were sort of now, hey, look, it's your moment. And it's like, yeah. Of all the times to have a moment, this is the moment, seriously. And so, you know, just really just kind of reaching out to folks and, and just building that network of just check it. How are you doing? And when somebody asks you, you answer, you tell them, you're vulnerable. You say, look, it's hard. I'm tired. Like, and that's for me, I think this has been one of the biggest things that I came to realize. Like, I'm just tired. And, you know, why is it that when people are checking in and, you know, allies are coming from left and right and center and from five years ago, you know, I'm suddenly just kind of irritated. And it's not because I, I don't like the, the gesture. I just, I realize like I'm, I'm exhausted. And on top of that, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm trying to build a company. I'm trying to build a business. I'm trying to build a future for, you know, 300 plus people that have come on this journey with me. And so, you know, I carry that burden very heavily. I carry the burden of, of what it represents. If I can build something successful, if I can build a public company, if I can build a multi-billion dollar success, this is really about creating that prototype that this is not charity. This is about finding high performing people that can return value. And so again, just checking with yourself, making sure that you're good because you're no good to anybody. If you're too tired, you're too exhausted, you're too worn out, you can't help a soul. And so the first thing you have to do is be very selfish about, you know, my man beast mode, right? Check your mental, like make sure first off and foremost that you keep your head right because we got a long road ahead of us. And along, along the way, your family needs you, your community needs you, your friends need you. And you're just, again, you're no good if you wear yourself into the ground. Um, so I have, I've compartmentalized my life. <laughs> So I have, you know, friends in the political world, and, and it all kind of marries, but I have friends in the political world. I have my CBO, my community-based organization friends. It's very challenging working in community sometimes. Sometimes the community can be insatiable. They can be tiring. And so those CBO friends are great to call when you're feeling stressed out or tired and just kind of reaffirming you. Um, I have community friends. I mean, people in the hood that invite me to their parties. And they're, they're great. They actually really um, energize me. Um, people energize me, but they really energize me. Um, I also don't look at any editorial news on the networks. That means no CNN, no Fox, no MSNBC. I largely look at just nightly news. And I have my different news sources on my podcast and my YouTube sources. I listen to lots of Black Empowerment Radio <laughs> because that's really, you have to get your sources from real Black folk on the ground for real, not black folk that are kind of picked and chosen for CNN. It's a very different perspective. So I'm very in, in, interested in making sure I keep my ear to the ground in that perspective. And that, that actually energizes me as well. And I have a really good personal life, really supportive partner, really supportive um, home life. And that is like the base of all the energy. So I just kind of like compartmentalize everything, but it all kind of is interwoven. I want to hear what Charles says. Charles, I know. I'm waiting on Charles. On deck, man. What's up? I thought, oh, we're out of time. I will be quick. Um, so uh, we have a four-year-old this Sunday. She turns four on this. Uh, this oh, Sunday. congrats! <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. She's very excited. That's yeah. that's that stability. I think for us. Um, and uh, one of the decisions we even made was to consciously kind of wrap her in a bubble right now. Uh, and my wife and I talked about that. It was she's going to have to worry about her father, her uncle, her cousins, her aunties, you know, enough for the rest of her life. She's gonna have this fight for probably the rest of her life. So we kind of wrapped a bubble around her and that's been very centering uh, for us, especially while, while trying to deal with first the pandemic and, you know, navigating that with her and, and now this. So that's been the first part is family. Uh, and that's a core for me. The second um, is uh, kind of the pullback. Like I've gotten off Twitter. I was on Twitter a lot more before. I've just pulled back. Uh, like really, it's like, we, I, I'll go in there to check people, you know, see who's talking that I care about. I have my lists kind of thing. Uh, my research tends to be, is in democracy and election systems. So I have a whole group over there that I can listen to that's kind of, you know, a little bit separate from the, the constant chaos, but really drilling down on policy questions or technology questions that we're trying to solve for the upcoming election. So that, that's a grounding, a grounding space uh, for me uh, as well. Otherwise, uh, I, there are three things that I've, um, and I've been working on this even personally. One is being more open. Uh, so just kind of sharing, uh, I think vulnerability, uh, maybe talk about being vulnerable. I think maybe we'll mention that. Maybe uh, it was Derek, I apologize. Uh, but, but just being open and sharing like, hey, this is, this bothers me. 
Um, I, usually I don't share those things. Those things I kind of like, I keep inside. Uh, the second is not judging anybody, really focusing on not judging anybody um, and just allowing everyone to kind of navigate how they need to navigate, trying to be supportive of that. And the third, and I'm speaking definitely as a parent, just being empathetic um, of like of, of what's going on. And so I find these kinds of spaces to be actually very um, useful for me. Uh, very oddly enough safe. I mean, I won't know most of the people who are listening to this or who may watch the recording of this, uh, but just the call to action as we'll put it earlier. Um, just, you know, hearing uh, Derek's, you know, work and his take, uh, listening to, you know, Tyra's, you know, positions um, and leadership, those and, and having this kind of open, honest conversation, that's me trying to practice those things. Uh, and I find a, a comfort in that um, and a stabilizing force in that. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, these are definitely tips. I'm in my head like, oh, I should try that. <laughs> Check out Instagram, you know, stop the scrolling. So all of this information has definitely been helpful. Don't stop until you friend me on Instagram because I just, I just request it. <laughs> <laughs> <Got you. laughs> um, thank you all. This has been really great. So we have about 10 more minutes for questions. And I know we've gotten a few people raising their hands. So uh, Charles, uh, if, you, if you can unmute Charles, um, we'll take the first audience question. Is it okay that I can't see the questions or anything? Okay. Oh, he's, he's, he's there, he's gonna ask it. There, there's another Charles on the call. And I, when you said Charles uh, earlier, I was like, oh, that's not me. Uh, my name is Charles Burns. I work with Angela, I work at Uber. Uh, I work in our global security team. And uh, this has been a great panel. Uh, the question I have, and I, I come from a, just a background, I work on a security team, but I also wore the uniform as a uh, state police officer for uh, 10 years in Indiana, way back when. And this is for Derek. Um, sure. One of my, my question was, is, is I heard you, you talking, how, this is probably going to put you on the spot, two questions. Okay. Number one, what, what is the uh, kind of sentiment amongst the law enforcement officials when folks say defund the police department? That's my first question. If you can't answer, that's okay. But okay. the second one is, as you go out to the neighborhoods and do some things in the city, how can we in the private sector partner more closely with law enforcement um, um, uh, in the community there to, uh, to really bring some great things and show that uh, while there, there has been, and I can say this, I think I've earned the right, while there unfortunately has been some very bad incidents, that there are some good law enforcement officials out there and how can we play a part of that in the private sector? Excellent, and thank you so much for that question. And I know I'll start off with the first part. Um, just, to, just to answer that question, um, instead of calling defunding, we're calling it direct redirecting. Um, but when it comes to supporting the black community, definitely all in with that. Uh, we definitely want to do that. I think uh, some of the concern you have from, from some department is, oh my God, am I gonna lose my job? Are I gonna let, a, let us go? Hi. So, I mean, of course you have that. So you're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, we don't know what the number is, but we know that there will be a number. So you have everyone on standby until August 1st. So this of course, like in any job, if you hear that you know, funds will be shifting, everyone's thinking about, hey, I got a family, how can I support them? So um, just, just initially, yes, uh, definitely support redirecting the funds to the African-American community. Uh, but just a little concern in figuring out, does that mean I'm gonna lose my job? Does that mean we're gonna lose 100 officers? Does that mean we're gonna shift everybody around? So you, you, you have that uncertainty. Um, and, and on the second part, um, I, I love, love, love um, looking and working for partnerships, especially on the private side. Uh, as I touched on before, um, you know, when I first got on board with SFPD, you know, I created, you know, the first annual Black History Month celebration, as well as the second one, uh, Mother's Day and Father's Day events, uh, conversations, a little bit of everything. But um, I always have brought in great partners, uh, great partners to create opportunities, to create conversations where we can figure out ways that we can work with the community. So when it comes to partnering, I'm definitely all in um, with that. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to send you, I'm sure I can kind of get your information, but I'd love to send you my contact info um, and love to see if we can talk offline because there's so many different opportunities for uh, the private side to support the work that uh, the police department is doing as well as the city and our various communities. So we'd we'll love to chat with you about that. Yeah, I'm curious, Will, from your perspective, is it something that you're seeing um, companies 
consider and, and look at as well? From a law enforcement perspective? Yeah, our, um, partnerships and... Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of the reaction, and I, I spoke earlier about, I think a lot of folks in the Valley tend to go into the savior mode. So your first question is always like, you know, where's the most disenfranchised group that I can go in and invest time in? So I don't, I don't hear the conversation about law enforcement. I love it. I will say, and I encourage people this all the time that, you know, when it comes to how you can impact the community, um, don't just think about the folks, you know, who are, who are struggling the most because there is lots of help and support that does need to be applied there, but recognize like that's a journey, right? You're, you're investing a lot of time. Sometimes you need professional skills and talent. Um, we also tend to kind of cater to kind of the very upper echelon, the high-performing athletes, the high-performing academics. What about the kid in the middle? What about the kid going up baby, baby use 100 point who's got a 2.9 grade average with um, a single family home who, you know, working mother doesn't get a lot of time to help support homework. That's a superstar. And so I personally try to encourage folks to, you know, again, you want to, you want to be passionate about where you apply your, your time, but just don't overlook necessarily the folks that tend to get overlooked the most because that's where I believe sometimes just a little bit of an investment of time of mentorship of allyship you can accelerate that 2.9 to a 4.0 and I'm not at all discouraging people who want to go work with folks that are dealing with much more adversity they're in much harder situations but recognize like in a lot of those cases swooping in and out is not necessarily an, an effective approach. You can be much more effective with partnering with agencies and professionals that are actually focused on, you know, therapies and practices that are, that are effective with, with this part of the population. So that's just kind of my, my initial take. I, I love the question about law enforcement. I never really thought about it that way. I'd love to follow up with Derek and, and try to understand more as an organization. I do think that trust factor is important. And if we can get that piece right, like we talked about, it's incremental change that I think provides a framework for how we can work on other issues in society. And so I love just narrowing down the focus of how do we establish more trust? Make that the KPI. Let's have a goal that's, that, that's nominal, not just transformational. We just want to get to a better trust and trust index with the community. That would be phenomenal. Absolutely. Tyra, you look like you have something on your mind. Good luck with that. <laughs> I'm on the Charles line. I mean, I, it, to me, I'd be more interested in retired Black officers going into communities, partnering with the YMCA to train young boys in particular, but all Black youth on how to engage the police. In the case of Mario Woods, which happened a few blocks from my house when I was working from home, so I was pretty much on site pretty quickly. You know, when people would draw butter knives, uh, tasers, it seems like it, uh, a kill is unwarranted. But if you know that officers are not trained that way, they are trained to kill if you if they see a threat. And that could be a butter knife. A lot of our black kids don't know, they don't know how to deal with a cop. Your job is to survive the encounter and deal with any injustices after the fact. Mm -hmm. There should be black officers, retired, go into these communities and teach these young kids about policies they may not understand, protocol, and how to engage officers. I think that would be a really good partnership. I, I love that idea, Tyra. So let's talk offline and see. About yeah. <laughs> yes, seriously. I got you, Derek. <laughs> no, seriously, I like that. Thank you. Okay. We got, uh, oh, oh, thanks, Charles. <laughs> uh, we got another question. If you could only ask people to do one action, what would it be to make change? Listen. I'll provide tangibles. Oh, can you elaborate what you, on that Tangibles. one? Tangibles, no more symbolic gestures, no more kente cloths in yeah. Congress, no more. Um, we want tangibles. Sure, we want the Black Lives Matter sign, the one I co-produced is on F Folsom Street in the uh, Fillmore. However, we want, those, we want those symbolic gestures backed up with tangibles. You show your allyship by helping me produce tangibles for my community. I think, I mean, collaborating. Um, I mean, one of my slogans is always teamwork makes the dream work and doing things together to take Dear. things to the next level. So that's my collaborating. Yeah. Your thought, Charles? Um, oh, Charles? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, how to, how, to, how to provide support, is that fair? Again, to oversimplify? Um, I'm going to say uh, money and time. Uh, to the tangible point, um, uh, it's you know everyone has money, um, and I grant there is time, but they have ways to share and build their network out. Um, to to you know it's like you know some people say well I don't have money I don't have time it's like but you have you're on Twitter, <laughs> there's there's knowledge and information and networks that you can expand and you can engage and you can bring people to, 
you can educate within your own world. Um, if you do have the time, uh, joining commissions, um, local commissions, uh, and it, it, there are 170 commissions in San Francisco, right? Entertainment commission overlaps with the police department. If you're really trying to support and bring about change, yep. entertainment commission, so to speak. I mean, if there's a space obviously available, um, and bring those values um, and and those you know those objectives, going back to those tangibles. Uh, listen, right? <laughs> you can listen. You can figure out what those tangibles are. You can be an ally, and then you can help make those things happen um, to whatever outside the to make curriculum groups. You can make those uh, tangible actions. Uh, you can implement those tangible actions. Excuse me. Um, on those commissions, and there's a variety of different ways to do that. So when I talk about support, I think there are a variety, there are many, many ways to do that. Uh, and then there's also just getting behind, obviously, and really engaging locally. People don't vote down ballots. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you. Well, sorry, what'd you say? <laughs> I have a big, big conversation point on voting down ballot, and, and that, that cuts across the lines from just about everybody. Sorry. Yep. Well, thank you all. It looks like if there's no more, this is last call for anyone who has questions. We've got two more minutes. Anyone else? I think this was actually a great point to end on. Um, just thinking as, as we walk away from this conversation, you know, things that we should all be doing. So thank you for, for rounding out a great discussion. And Liku, thank you so much for moderating. Um, Okay, yep, no more questions. So um, with that, this, as I mentioned in the beginning, this will be recorded uh, for anyone who may have came late or if you wanna share with, um, with your colleagues and your friends, we'll be posting it on um, the CB YouTube channel um, and our website. So again, uh, appreciate everyone here, all the panelists for donating your time for all your work in our community, um, much needed perspectives today and much needed work um, moving forward. So thank you all. Have a good Thank one. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a good night.